Hi, everyone. Um, I'm David Cervik. I'm from the Aerospace Engineering Department at the University of Colorado. So actually, my background is not really in AI planning, but the problem I wanted to solve was uh, a bit too difficult for conventional orbit um, planning methods. And um, I also had trouble kind of relating it to a lot of the research out there in AI planning, because it's kind of such an unusual problem. So afterwards, I'd be really interested to hear from you guys if you have uh, some references that I've overlooked that you think might be useful or some methods that you, know, you believe relate to this. Um, so the problem that I'm trying to solve is motion around uh, asteroids, comets, and small moons, which are um, targets of high priority for exploration missions due to their value for planetary science. Um, sometimes they're called primitive bodies because they're actually, uh, they're not big enough to undergo geologic processes, so they can tell us a lot about the um, the composition of the solar system during, during its formation. Of course, if there's um, an asteroid on an impact course, we need to know how it's going to respond to our methods to mitigate it, and we need to be able to operate well around it. And lastly, there's also some companies that are interested in uh, utilizing resources from these bodies. Um, so there's three good reasons to want to be able to do um, complex motion in close vicinity to them. Some examples here are the asteroid Itakawa that was uh, visited by um, the Hayabusa spacecraft from the Japanese Space Exploration Agency uh, several years back. Uh, you can see, of course, it's very irregular as asteroids are. Um, the Martian moon Phobos has also been um, a target for several proposed missions. And um, here you see it silhouetted, silhouetted against the sun as viewed from one of the Mars rovers. And what's interesting about this is not just that it's strangely shaped, but it's a small object. And the reason it looks so big is because it's in a very low orbit. And that means there's very strong tidal forces. So that makes the orbit, um, orbits around that body very complicated. And lastly, uh, Comet 67P triumov gerasimenko is currently being visited by the Rosetta spacecraft, which I'm sure most of you know about, especially if you saw um, Steve Chen's talk earlier. Um, so first, just to briefly touch on uh, what conventional mission design is like. Uh, for a lot, of, um, a lot of previous missions, you generally are orbiting a, a single body that's dominating your force environment and that is very, very nearly spherical, and that produces nearly Keplerian motion. And uh, Kepler described this motion in um, very simple terms with conic sections. Uh, and if you are on a bound orbit in this kind of system, then motion is roughly periodic. And it's very easy to, um, to say, where you'll be in the future. So because of that, there's conventional rule sets that exist for planning uh, transfers from one, one orbit to another in these kinds of systems. And in fact, even for more complicated scenarios, such as interplanetary mission design, uh, generally the first cut at a solution for these kinds of problems uh, can be uh, gained using a sequence of Keplerian problems. However, all that kind of goes out the window when you're orbiting an asteroid. Um, the irregular shape, as well as proportionally large forces from uh, third bodies and solar radiation pressure, which become large due to the low mass of the, um, of the asteroid, um, all of these cause complications uh, by making the, the dynamics far more sensitive, the motion very non-periodic, and combined with the fact that you um, simply don't know that much about these systems before you get there and that their shape can be complicated, there's lots of model uncertainty. So this all adds up to um, make a challenging planning problem and high risk of failure if you uh, don't do it right. So to quickly illustrate what I've just been talking about, um, for a Keplerian system, if you're orbiting a spherical body uh, in a, on a bound orbit, motion roughly follows an ellipse and you just repeat. Uh, of course, there's other complications for missions, for planning missions around these bodies, as you just saw. But from a purely dynamical perspective, they're fairly tractable. As soon as you um, start to distort that central body, as shown in the second image, for an approximated shape of asteroid Itakawa, motion quickly becomes very non-periodic and crazy, as I was just talking about. And what you're seeing here, the, the light gray shaded region, is just the volume within which um, the body is spinning, because this trajectory is shown in inertial space. And for Phobos, as I mentioned, there's very strong tidal forces, and it's really hard to find orbits there um, that are stable at all. There are classes of them, but it's, uh, they're somewhat rare. So there's a number of desired features that would be good for being able to um, design missions in these systems. Automation is key because of the complexity of the design space and its um, kind of imperviousness to intuition, as, long, as well as the fact that if you have to constantly replan, then it's really uh, a big burden if a human is going to be doing that. 
Uh, and it's even better if all of this can be done on board um, so that you have fast turnaround times and can be opportunistic uh, in response to off-nominal conditions. Because it really hurts you if you have to wait for um, your signal to get back to Earth and for humans to plan something and then beam it back to you. You can't respond quickly enough to, um, to deal with certain scenarios. Um, plus, it's just nice not to demand too much of the communication resources. So really, the approach that I've um, made for this problem uh, essentially is a reposing of a motion planning problem as regulation of an abstract state uh, via an intermittently act acting impulsive controller. And there's three key components to this. The first is a predictive model for abstract outcomes. Secondly, there's a heuristic search of the single impulse reachable sets. And third is a receding horizon implementation of this control scheme. So first, the predictive model. Um, I think I might use the word abstract differently than you guys, I'm not really sure. Uh, but what I mean by it is that um, we care not just where the path leads, but we also care what it means for the mission in terms of safety outcomes, satisfaction of goals, uh, which are maybe not defined just in strictly in terms of um, state space uh, points. And lastly, for automation, we need some kind of single metric of just how good those outcomes are. So from the um, reachability-based approach, I'm applying this map to an entire control domain of available maneuvers. Um, so if you consider that the spacecraft can instantaneously change its velocity up to a certain amount by aiming in any direction, that describes a, a sphere as a control domain from which a control input is selected. And this is mapped through the model to a set of reachable trajectories, a set of reachable mission outcomes, and a set of reachable scores. Now I'll kind of walk you through what that uh, roughly looks like, beginning with the Kepler problem because it's simpler. Um, so for this problem, I uh, was able to, since the Kepler problem has an analytical solution, I could come up with um, equations that describe the curves on this image on the left here. What this image is showing you is the domain is um, the velocity space, so the x and y axes are x and y velocities. The point in the center of this image uh, corresponds to a circular orbit. So if your velocity is, that, um, is at 0, 1 on this map, you're going to orbit the body circularly. Uh, and there's a region around there where there's other kinds of orbits that are more elliptical uh, and faster or slower that are also safe. But if you speed up too much in your interact direction, you reach the escape region. If you slow down too much, you'll fall into the center of the body. If you speed up straight towards the body, you crash into the body. So that's what that red region there is showing you is the a uh, set of velocities that result in impact, while well, the gold region shows you those that uh, result in escape. And on the right, I'm plotting the same thing, but obtained numerically. And the only difference you see here is that I've uh, color-coded it based on how soon the failure event happens. And there's also this white band to the right that is not filled in, and that's because um, those trajectories that would impact um, in that region take a long time to impact, and the numerical results are only obtained for a finite time horizon. Now to show how crazy things get with the strongly non-Keplerian systems, I've generated the same kind of plot for an orbiter around Phobos. Um, you see that there's much more complicated shape to the impact and escape regions. And in fact, I'm not showing this here, but if you increase the time horizon, then those safe reg regions continue to fill in with different failure regions, and the shape just becomes more and more complex. I've also thrown in there some goal regions that um, those are kind of another component of this uh, Y set here, just different mission outcomes that you want to achieve. And those regions signify that the spacecraft has flown through um, certain observation windows close to the surface, uh, close to target points that um, have been defined as goals for targets for observation. On the right is just um, a chunk from a full 3D reachable set. The left is just a 2D section that's shown by the green disk on the right. Um, and I've only shown one kind of outcome, so you can actually see something there. <laughs> so that's just a demonstration of the complexity of this reachable set that we are using as a tool for planning. Of course, with such a complicated set, you need a, a good heuristic for being able to accurately, um, to effectively search it in time to make good use of it for planning. So the process that I use for that, um, first, the control domain is seeded with a small uniform sample of maneuvers. And then repeat, uh, repetitively, the latest sample set is propagated through the um, predictive model via numerical integration. Then a mesh is constructed so that you use all of your sampled points within your control domain to define simple tetrahedral volume elements. 
And lastly, a weighted random sample of those elements is taken uh, to designate which ones are the regions from which the next set of uh, sampling maneuvers should be uh, selected. So it's an iterative refinement process on the spherical control domain. And really, the heuristic here is just the, the weighting on those, uh, those volume elements. So the first component is simply the, um, the actual volume of the element. And what this does is that instead of making each element uh, equally likely to be sampled, each point in the continuous space is equally likely. Uh, the next component is to uh, then kind of distort that probability distribution function based upon the lifespan of the trajectories that you're looking at. Um, so the longer lived a trajectory is, the more complexity can arise in that region of the reachable set. And finally, the third term is used to bias the search towards the regions of interest where the planning score S is higher. Um, this is augmented with uh, a goal missed distance Q that's useful for helping gradients that aid the search heuristic in finding uh, regions of S that are, are good, which is necessary because those goal regions could be quite small within the reachable set, as you see here. Um, so really, this is kind of a, a substitute for hill climbing. It's, it has a bit of the same effect and it allows you to hone in on very um, tough to reach um, solutions, or tough to identify solutions. And there's an exponent I'm putting on this term which increases as the search progresses. So as you get closer to your desired search resolution, um, that third component effect effectively uh, modulates the score based on these kind of curves. So near the end of the refinement process, only the very best scoring um, volume elements are being selected for additional sampling. So this is quite similar, or maybe even could say identical, to simulated annealing. So there's kind of a few different components of um, a few different search techniques that are kind of melded together here. And the performance that comes out is pretty good. Uh, here's just a kind of standard il um, ca characteristic illustrative case. On the left, you see the um, change in the um, the best score value identified via a few different search methods within uh, the same runtime on this on my MacBook Pro, and you get a much better score once you add in the uh, heuristic with the gradient augmentation. And on the right, it shows you just how hard fought that extra little bit of score is, because only um, a very small fraction of the uh, of the total volume of the control domain uh, maps to scores that are that high. And it, it kind of um, and you also see on that plot that the uh, the gradient aids kind of the descent of this curve to those very sparse um, maxima. Final ingredient um, that ties it all together is the receding horizon implementation. So um, there's kind of a separate heuristic applied here that um, aids the temporal decision making. Um, what really needs to be done is that short term progress, um, which I'm defining as an increase in the uh, the goal metrics has to be balanced against long-term prospects further down the road because really we're only looking a short ways into the, into the future. Uh, there's simply too, much, um, too many possibilities to plan very far ahead under these complex dynamics. So the preference that I'm enforcing currently, and I'll make this more complicated in the future, is simply that um, a final state on a trajectory looks promising if it's at a similar altitude to those that the goals are at. So this kind of gives you nicely structured reachability maps for your next maneuver. And also at, at this step, um, really it defines the timing of the subsequent maneuver because the term in the parentheses here is actually a, a time series. Um, that whole reachability map, the contents of that are a function of time. And you might not want to just go all the way to your time horizon. It might be better to stop earlier and this metric will identify when that is the case. Um, so here's some results for a mission I defined around Phobos. On the left, in the body-fixed rotating frame, you see colored regions that correspond to, um, those are your goal regions that give you a good vantage point on uh, targets defined on the surface for being, uh, for being observed. Um, all of the orange dots are different locations at which maneuvers occur and the mission profile satisfies all of the goals. On the right, in the inertial frame, uh, you can see that um, the goal regions, goal regions are no longer shown because they are not constant in that frame, but um, 
the diamonds that designate the beginning and ending of arcs that correspond to observations are all on the sun side of this body. And that's because there's one more constraint actually at play here, that those observations have to be conducted while the surface is well lit. And of course, nothing you see here really is that, um, I mean, <laughs> if you're familiar with orbit mechanics, you know that rotating frame trajectories are usually the weird ones. In the inertial frame, it usually looks pretty, pretty much like ellipses. But this system really is just completely different from um, most uh, mission design problems. Now for Itakawa, I also got a, uh, this is just another illustrative case to show you that um, this approach can cope with very complex dynamics that, and very different varieties of them because these two systems really have, um, they're both very non-Keplerian but in quite different ways. Itakawa is very, very strangely shaped whereas Bobos is less strangely shaped but has strong tides. And either way, you get a very tough planning problem, but you can solve it um, via the application of reachability analysis. And just to kind of quickly quantitatively show you um, how all of these things are uh, affecting this, I ran um, Monte Carlo simulations of uh, mission plans using uh, different search resolutions and different features turned on or off. Of course, if you use a good resolution and the heuristic with all the bells and whistles, then you get almost all of the goals done almost all of the time. Um, oh, and I should say failure here is defined as uh, going too many planning cycles without getting any extra goals done. If you move down to a grid search, of course, that costs you a lot of performance. Lower um, resolution costs you a lot of performance. That's not surprising either. Um, but you can see here that the, uh, the extra heuristic I added for making temporal decisions does have a very important effect on the consistency of the, um, the consistency of the planner. So in sum, small body, mi small body missions have uh, very complex design spaces that uh, seemed really difficult to locate any kind of um, standard off-the-shelf planning technique that was appropriate for this. Um, and they also defy the conventional approaches of um, Keplerian mission design. This autonomous receding horizon planning scheme uh, is enabled only via a very efficient reachability analysis because the planning space is really complexly structured. But this uh, planning paradigm seems uh, viable and could potentially enable um, new mission concepts and greater science returns in the future. And some of the next things I'll be doing with it are working on robustness to uncertainty, because as I mentioned early on, that's a very important aspect of um, small body emissions, since they have complex, not very well known shapes. Um, and really the receding horizon approach, I think will be quite conducive to robustness. Um, and I also would like to improve the performance in terms of fuel spent and time spent in the missions by adding more kind of sophisticated aspects to that um, that heuristic that tells you where to terminate your planning state, your planning trajectory, your current trajectory. Uh, and I'd like to thank NASA for funding my research and let you all know that I will be presenting this as a poster on Thursday. So if you think of any extra questions between now and then, uh, please come find me on Thursday or, be or before then. And uh, thanks for listening and I'll take your questions now. Yeah.